bit about my third, uh, most recent book, which is all about uh, an iconic New England institution. You know, everyone at Chronicle knows that when I am traveling the road, uh, there are two, whether or not they involve the story that I'm out to do or not, that there are two New England institutions that I cannot pass by. Uh, one is a diner, right? Also born in New England, just like the general store. Um, and the other is uh, a general store. Now, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, 20 maybe even, I began to be aware that diners were making something of a comeback. Fewer and fewer diners were disappearing at the rate they had been. By the, by the late 60s, early 70s, it began to seem like, but for very few, diners would disappear. They were being overtaken by the rise of various chain stores and franchises and so forth, but they didn't. They didn't. And about 10 years ago, maybe even less, I started to notice that the same thing was true of general stores, that they seemed to be stabilizing what had been a terrible, terrible slide to what seemed to be sure obscurity. But they didn't. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about why that came to be, why it was the general stores did not slide completely into <laughs> extinction. Right? So this is an example, as you well know, nothing getting anything by you people, obviously, very biologically and zoologically inclined. This is an example of an endangered species that became completely extinct. You will not find a dodo bird on the face of planet Earth today. Now this is an example of an endangered species that is not yet completely extinct. And so is this. Now, when it came to the kind of predator that drove the dodo bird to complete extinction, here you have an artist's rendering, when it comes to the type of predator that has been, or had been, driving general stores to what seemed to be complete extinction, I'm going to tell you right now, none of our hands are clean. You may have consorted with one of these predators recently. I have, just within the last 72 hours. <laughs> right? However, however, there's a reason why I chose these two very, very, very contemporary renditions of these two big box stores. In fact, this is so new it's not even been built yet. There's a reason, because when general stores began their slide to extinction, what seemed to be certain extinction, Sam Walton was still running things out of a single store in Missouri. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon, which is why I'm contrasting the slide of general stores over the last 50 years to extinction with these very new big box stores, because big box stores are not responsible. I was joking partly about the predator, because big box stores are not responsible for what happened to general stores. How's that? Well, so I always like to point to one of my favorite chroniclers of American popular culture for noticing something, oh there you are, for noticing something that a lot of people missed when he was noticing it, which is often the case, you know? I mean, you can be sure that in the mid to late 19th century there weren't a lot of people who said, have you noticed there weren't a lot of dodo birds? Right? So we often miss things that are disappearing until they're gone. So in 1960, John Steinbeck, pictured here with his best friend Charlie, set off to circumnavigate America in his GMC custom-built pickup with the camper in the back, which he named Rosinante. Anybody know what Rosinante referred to? Librarians are not allowed to respond because they know the answer to everything, right? You know what they say, if you want an answer to something, Google it. If you want the right answer, ask a librarian. Right? Because they curate the answer. You knew. Did you want to use workhorse? Workhorse. No. Rosinante, Rosinante, 
close. It has to do with a horse, but Rosinante was Don Quixote's horse. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know. It was on the tip of your tongue. I know. I didn't know that until I researched it. So he nicknamed it Rosinante. He circumnavigated America with Charlie in 1960-62. And look what he noticed over half a century ago that the little villages seem to be disappearing along with all the many types of unique little stores, including general stores, that inhabited these little villages, and he noticed that more than half a century ago. Now, when Steinbeck was growing up in Salinas, California, over 100 years ago, this was a scene that was instantly recognizable to virtually every American. In fact, if you didn't, if you didn't patronize a place like this in your day-to-day, -day, your parents almost certainly did. And it was familiar to everyone. And yet, when you go out 50 years past this point, they've begun to disappear. And the reason why they began to disappear, you know, it's not the big box store, right? Box is a three-letter word, but it was a different three-letter word that began car. The car was responsible for the beginning of the general store's demise. Because the car spelled bigger words like mobility. Now you could jump in your car. It changed the way people approached their work. It changed the way people approached the idea of moving about the country. And it changed the way people went about their day-to-day -day business, including where they bought stuff. And 25 years after the former picture was taken, by the way, this is 1950, when for the very first time, a majority of Americans owned an automobile. 25 years later, you have the mushrooming of the interstate highway system. So now, if you live in small town America, and this is the choice at your local store, where you would normally run in to buy a quart of milk, a carton of eggs, or a stick of butter, now, if you jump in that car that is outside your house parked in the driveway, and you drive in an exit or two on the interstate, you've got this. So if you've got this, and you're competing with this, you've got a problem, right? However, a funny thing happened on the way to extinction. And this irony is why I decided to write the book. Because it turns out that the same forces that were poised to completely snuff out the humble little general store become the same forces that helped save them. Sounds like a paradox, right? So this is the story of saving the general store. So, by the time you get to the late 60s and 70s, you have the, along with, this goes right along with the mushrooming of the interstate highway system and the mobility that Americans now have, thanks to the automobile. And you have the rise of suburbia in a way that it had never existed before. Game changer. Game changer. You have these sprawling suburban communities that are funneling out from urban centers. In fact, in places like Atlanta, they have to coin a new term. Ever heard of the exurbs? Right, because they've completely obliterated the boundary between urban and suburban. It's just one big, long, massive sprawl, right? And in these super communities that I call super suburban communities, you now have a lifestyle that didn't exist before. Didn't exist before the 60s and 70s. You have these, these suburban communities now where you have great school systems in many cases. You have all kinds of suburban amenities and, and community centers and great athletic programs and so forth. And in the morning, you've got strip malls lining your way to work and you can stop and get 18 different kinds of coffee and your choice of breakfast, um, muffin, burrito, whatever the hell you want. But you know what? It's funny. It turns out you can live yards from your next door neighbor surrounded by a volume that your parents had never dreamed about living amidst and with amenities and square footage of a house that your parents had never dreamed of. These are the boomers in this period of time, right? Starting their own families. And yet it turns out, irony again of ironies, that you can still be missing something. In these suburban communities that seem to have everything, a lot of people were curiously missing something. Another irony. Community. So it turns out that what constitutes a community and that's a word I'm going to be using a lot. If this was a drinking game. <laughs> so, so 
it turns out that community is not constituted simply by how many people can be living in the same place. Apparently, that does not constitute a community. But not everybody knew that. Not everybody knew that. One extraordinary American who I fervently feel does not get enough credit did begin to put his finger on what it is that does make up community. And he coined a term for it called the third place. Maybe some of you have heard of it. He's a wonderful American sociologist named Ray Oldenburg. And he spent a decade, he spent a decade in the 70s researching what community means in America. And what he found when his book came out in 1989, The Great Good Place, what he found is one of those things that sounds disarmingly simple. Like I'll show you right now what he means by the third place, and you think to yourself, well, yeah, I know that. <gasps> no, you didn't. None of us did. What he found was that in America, no matter how free as a word we all feel, right? Like that's like the lodestone of America, right? Is that we're free. We're free. We can do whatever we want. Say whatever we want. Go wherever we want. But it turns out what Ray Oldenburg found, in spite of how free we are, we still spend the vast majority of our lives in one of only three basic places. The first place, which you can probably guess, home, family. The second place. The important thing is that when it comes to a third place in American life, what makes them unique is that when you go there, when you go there, you have the expectation, conscious or not, that you will be interacting with people from your community. People from your community. And what he also found out that was groundbreaking was that that's not just like a nice thing. You know, it's not like, well, I'm going to drop into the corner variety store and I, maybe I'll see Jake in there and say hi. No, we actually need that. And when these places disappear, it's a need that goes unmet. It's not a trivial thing. It is as important, we found, as work and home. And they were beginning to disappear. That's why he wrote his book. And so what happens? So think of those big suburban communities. So a lot of people in those big suburban communities in the suburbs, right? Metropolitan areas, all over the country, but we're talking about New England. So the suburbs of, of Boston and Bridgeport and Providence and Bangor and Portland and Manchester, in these big suburban communities, a lot of folks, whether they realize it or not, are beginning to feel like they're missing community. Things are getting developed, they're starting their own families, and they want, a lot of these folks want their children to have more of a sense of community than they think is now there. And so they strike out for small towns all across New England. It wasn't like a, a wave of humanity, but it was a sizable, it was a sizable number of people. The data shows it had moved from these suburban communities in the 70s, early 80s, and they're in search of a more of a sense of community than they're finding in these metropolitan areas. And in places like Barnard, Vermont, they find it. They find it. It's not the only place. I've just chosen this because what it shows, you know, is that the sense of community that they found at the general store in Barnard, Vermont, was the same third place, right? A genuine gathering place for the community. It was the same third place in 1945 as it was in 1985, as it was in 2005. Same store. It had never changed. So they were delighted. Right? They felt like, this is what we moved here for. This is what I'm talking about, right? And this is great. And in fact, a lot of them bought general stores. They talked the talk, they walked the walk. And this is great for about 25 years. And then what happens is you get to the late 90s, early 2000s, and you have a confluence of bad things. For one thing, the economy goes in the tank. A lot of these folks are getting up in years and they're thinking, if they own a general store, maybe I'd like to sell the store. Maybe I'd like to see if somebody else would like to carry on the tradition of the general store that I own. Hmm, problem is, 
bad economy, nobody is coming forward to buy these general stores. By 2001, you have 9-11, and the economy and tourism goes off in some places around New England, almost 90% in some areas. These stores vitally depend, especially at key times of year on tourism. And so a lot of these stores away from general stores. And now, by the early 2000s, it really does look like even though there had been this, this kind of rebirth for a lot of general stores because of these folks who moved to these small towns, it really does begin to look like the hard edge of finances, the economy, will do what other demographics haven't been able to do and kill the general store off once and for all. And I really believe that that's what would have happened were it not for what happened in one small town in New Hampshire. I really believe that if the small town of South Olmstead, New Hampshire, had not settled on doing collectively what didn't seem to be possible individually, that there would be easily, easily, 50% fewer general stores in New England today. Because what they did in South Olmstead, where there's been a general store for over 100 years, and by the way, all the general stores in this book have been around for at least a century, and two-thirds of them, a little more than two-thirds, have been around for twice that long, more than 200 years. They have all, by the way, been in the same physical footprint for all of that time, with one sterling exception, which we'll get to right at the end, and they have all always been nothing but a general store, all the stores in here. And the same was true in South Olmstead. Fellows coming back from the Civil War who lived in South Olmsted in that area of the hills of uh, South Central Vermont, uh, New Hampshire. Stopped by the village store, were treated to a dinner. However, in 2001, in the wake of 9-11, the owners who had owned the store for 37 years at that point, way longer than the average, couldn't do it anymore. They put the store up for sale, firmly hoping that somebody would come forward to buy the store, and no one did. And the store closed and went dark. And the little village of South Alstead came to grips over the next two and a half years with the fact that the one single, true, genuine community gathering place for their community was gone. And they wrestled with what they might be able to do. They tried to attract somebody, you know, somebody to come forward. Somebody they could attract to town to buy the store and reopen it didn't happen. And they finally realized, you know what? If we really, really want our store, then we will have to come together and find a way to do this collectively. And they did. And they formed a co-op, which had not been done. And they formed a co-op just like a food co-op. You put in X number of hours a week working in the store, you get X amount of discount on your groceries. They went to work inside the store where they made a wonderful little cafe. They built a pizza oven out back to bring in more revenue. They started having harvest dinners, which today attract visiting chefs from all over New England. And today, the South Olmstead Village store is doing better than ever. I hope the lights don't go out there again anytime soon. But in Shrewsbury, Vermont, my favorite example of how it took a village to save the general store, and it took Mother Nature to test them on whether or not they could actually maintain it. So when this picture was taken, and by the way, this is downtown Shrewsbury, Vermont. <laughs> At rush hour, for all I know. Uh, uh, when this picture was taken, Marjorie Pierce, right here, was in her mid-70s. And at that point in time, her family had already owned and operated Pierce's store for almost 70 years. But 20 years later, if you're doing the math at home, she's now in her mid-90s. And she would like really nothing more than to be able to take a little time off. <laughs> what, are you going to begrudge her? She's 94. Poor lady doesn't want to stand on her feet all day. Problem is, if she's not there to run the store, open it in the morning, run it all day, go home at night, nobody else can do it. Nobody's there to do it. You can't do it anymore. So at a certain point, she had to close the store, and it closed. In the heart and soul of downtown Shrewsbury, Vermont, again, that may also be a rush hour, uh, was closed. Was closed. And in Shrewsbury also, they felt awful. Marjorie Pierce felt awful. Every time she heard somebody at the post office or whatever 
talking about how much they miss the store and how they don't run into their friends anymore because they don't run into them at the Pearsons, she felt terrible. She couldn't reopen the store, but she did decide to call up a good friend of hers who just so happens to be one of my favorite New Englanders ever. Or ever. Paul Bruton. Paul is the creator and the executive director of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And I can almost guarantee you that even if you're not familiar with the PTV, you are probably thankful and familiar with some of the work they've done. What they started doing in Vermont, they now do all over America, and that is to help small cities and towns hold on to their local history. And that's not out of a keen sense of uh, sentimentality or nostalgia. That is out of a hard-edged economic sense. They have, and they've proven, that cities and towns that hold on to their history have a much better chance of being able to be economically sustainable in the future than those that obliterate, gave them over, and hope for a developer. I always said, look at it this way. I, I don't know Chelmsford well enough, but um, I'm, I'm sure you pass something like this all the time. We all do, right? Think of a, a lot where something has been torn down. It's usually something commercial that's been torn down. And there's a sign that seems to have been there forever that says, we'll build to suit, right? 34 acres for sale, prime retail location. And the sign seems to be there forever, right? That's what the Preservation Trust cautions cities and towns not to do. Because just like a house, they have learned that developers want to see the bones of what they might develop. And that's why, even though we had a hard time in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, there were many cities and towns across America, certainly in New, in, in New England and Massachusetts. You know, you look at Haverhill, Los Angeles, Woonsocket. Many of these cities would have loved to have torn down old mill buildings. Old mill buildings that had become derelict, abandoned, right? Havens for drugs and crime. And those are very expensive to tear down. And many of them didn't. And now, many of those same cities and towns, you look at them, they get down on their hands and knees now. And that city's government, thank God, they didn't tear those down because that became the source of their revival. That's why it's a bedroom community today for commuters who go to Boston. Where do they live? The renovated mill buildings. So this is what the Preservation Trust knows. OK, I got sidetracked. That is not what Marjorie Pierce called up Paul Brewer to talk about. I want to have a conversation with you, Paul, about mill buildings. No. She called him up, and she said, Paul, I need to talk to you. And he said, OK. And he jumped in his beat up Prius, and he drove down from Burlington. Because what else would you be driving from Burlington for mine? <laughs> Paul is just that hip. He actually wears Birkenstocks. OK. Doesn't make I love Paul. So he came down to Shrewsbury, and she said, Paul, I need to reopen the store. <clears throat> and he said, Marjorie, how are you going to do that to you? And she said, I'm not going to do it. You are. He said, excuse me? So she said, I'm going to give you $10,000, which is pretty much all the money I have, but I don't expect to need it too much more. And the stoa is yours. Well, Paul had to explain to Marjorie that that's not what the Preservation Trust does. He tried to explain to her, dear, we don't own property outright, not a single one. We help cities and towns take ownership and invest in their own properties. But we don't buy property. We don't own property. And Marjorie said, piffle. <laughs> well, they went back and forth for about 30 minutes, according to Paul. But needless to say, about 30 minutes later, Paul was back in his beat-up Prius, making his way back up to Burlington. And the Preservation Trust owned its first piece of property outright. <laughs> to hear Paul tell it, he said, you try saying no to Marjorie Pierce. However, he did come back down to Shrewsbury about a week and a half later, and he met with the local historical society because he had deputized them in a very important way. And they all met, including my friend Sally Deinzer, right there in the middle. And he told them that he said, you folks are going to run the store. And they looked at him aghast, right? They said, Paul, 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 we'd love to help, but we're not business people. We're, we're, we're farmers, we're craftspeople, we're artisans. We don't know anything about running a store. And Paul told them, reassured them that we've done this before. It's taken two years, you're going to have plenty of homework, we're going to do lots of field trips. And he was right. And they learned how to do inventory, 
They learned how to fit out a general store. They completely renovated the interior of Pierce's, which I always feel like looks like what you would get if you paid a Hollywood set designer, right? Half a million dollars to design the set for a general store, but it looks exactly like that. I sat in the red chair last November, and they were able to reopen the store. I'm not saying it didn't go off without a single hitch, because right before they were set to reopen in 2009, uh, they went back before the town, and mind you, this is a town of under 1,000 people, under 900 people, that raised over $45,000. It's a lot of money. And yet they went back before the town, just before they reopened, and they said, we need another $1,500. Oh, people were like, what? They, what they explained was that they really felt that if they were going to create a genuine community gathering place, that they could assure the town would be there through thick and thin and the worst that a Vermont winter could throw at them, they had to have an emergency generator. The lights have to be able to stay on. And there was a lot of grousing, you know, people are, oh, Marjorie Pierce never named her. <laughs> but they got it. They got it. They reopened the store in 2009, and the beating heart of Little Shrewsbury, Vermont, was beating once again for two years. And in 2011, uh, yeah. In 2011, they had to contend with the worst natural disaster in Vermont's history. You may recall that Hurricane Irene, even though it had been downgraded to a tropical storm by the time it reached the Green Mountains, it still was packing almost 70 mile an hour winds. And all through Vermont, the power went out. It blew away, it swept away 200 year old covered bridges like so much driftwood. The power and the lights went out all over Vermont that first day of Irene including Shrewsbury, Vermont, except one little spot. <laughs> because late in the afternoon of Hurricane Irene hitting the Green Mountains, Sally Geiser and her crew trooped over through the howling wind and the flying debris and the pouring rain, and they fired up that emergency generator, and the lights came on, and to hear Sally tell it, she says, she told me, you know, she said, it looked like something out of Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> she said, I looked out down the hill, and there were people who were just like coming out of the trees, <laughs> seeking out the light. And they got the pierces, and the lights were on, and the coffee was hot, and the Wi-Fi was working, and people were able to call their relatives and tell them everything was okay. And curiously, Nobody's ever complained about the emergency generator ever again. Now, so we've talked so far. We've already covered in our chronology. We've covered the initial how general stores came to be threatened and how they responded to the threat of extinction. First, by people coming together to save the general store. But as the economy has improved in the ensuing decades, there have been people who have been able single-handedly to save a general store. In fact, I love this. One of my favorites is not too, too far from here, and I'm sure many of you are familiar in Carlisle with firms, right? How many of you? Yeah, I'm not surprised. I don't get this reaction on the vineyard. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yes, and you know, until very recently, two of my favorite general store owners in the world, they, they've sold it now, as you may know, but they have sold it. In fact, Larry and Rob and Beerfield, they held out until they had a buyer who was committed contractually to continuing the general store. So good for them. And they did. And you know, I like to joke with Larry that he is the only person in this chapter I call Honey, I Bought the Store, who actually uttered those words, Honey, I Bought the Store. Now, he corrected me the first time he came to a talk and he said, no, 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 I didn't say, Honey, I Bought the Store. I said, Honey, we're gonna buy the store. I said, really, Larry? And that's a distinction without a difference, because I said, you and I both know very well. You're very lucky Robin didn't say, honey, I hope you still have the receipt. So she did, and thank goodness, and uh, they ran it for many, many years. But my favorite Honey About the Store involves, of all things, a Hollywood celebrity. A Hollywood, bona fide Hollywood celebrity, Steve Carell, uh, otherwise known as, well, America's worst boss, really, uh, if you've ever watched The Office. Uh, now, indulge me for a minute. So close your eyes. Close your eyes. I want you to get a picture in your head. Sort of like think like uh, uh, you know American Gothic, right, Grant Wood. So get a picture in your head of a husband and wife couple who are the proud, proud beaming owners of an old, authentic New England general store. And 
and they're so proud of this old general store that's full of rich history and still going today. Open your eyes. Does it look like this? <laughs> no? Uh, what, you can't own a general store and own a tux? Well, you are looking at exactly that. You are looking at the proud owners of an authentic, old, historic New England general store. Steve Carell grew up not too far from here at all. He grew up in Acton, Massachusetts. I don't know how many of you knew that, but you know, when I interviewed Steve for the book, I call him Steve now. Uh, when, I, when I interviewed Steve for the book, I asked him, um, where does your interest in general stores come from, Mr. Hollywood? And he said that was, when he was growing up in Acton, there was an old general store, unfortunately long gone, but he said he was, he was, he was fascinated by this general store. He said, I, was, I would just like, go there on my bike just to watch the guy who owned the store. You know, I just watch him stocking the shelves and going outside to pump gas and coming in, making sandwiches, hopefully washing his hands first. But he said he was fascinated by this, and he also said it was the first place that he was allowed to go, little Steve Carell, on his little bicycle with his own allowance money to buy candy at the general store. How many of you had the same experience? How many of you, for how many of you was it a small local store where you were allowed to go first? and buy something at the, me too, me too. I grew up a little bit to the east of here, I, on the water. I grew up uh, in Winthrop, Massachusetts, or as I like to refer to it, the charming little seaside town at the end of runway 27L. <laughs> uh, it was a very noisy channel, I'll tell you. But it was a local store where I was allowed to go first, and so it was for Steve, and also for his wife, Nancy. She grew up on the South Shore in Cohasset, and she would go next door, especially, she said, on, on summer evenings with her big sister, Tish, and they would go over to local, uh, to nearby Marshfield, to the Marshfield Hills General Store, and buy stuff there. So about 15 years ago now, Nancy's sister, Tish, went out to Hollywood to visit, over Christmas time, her sister and her, her celebrity brother-in-law. And while she was there, she told Nancy that the Marshfield Hills General Store is up for sale. And Nancy said, who do you think is going to buy it? And Tish said, I don't know if anybody's going to buy it. She said, according to the Globe, I'm reading on the way out here, a local developer has proposed turning into the condos. And at that point, Steve said he overheard this conversation. He went into the kitchen to join the conversation. Long story short, when Nancy's sister Tish returned east that Christmas time, she had with her a check with which to purchase the Marshfield Hills General Store. And it is, I wasn't kidding, it is an authentic general store. Uh, during the Civil War, Union Army uniforms were stitched in the attic room up there. It is one of the few general stores left in New England where there is a working post office attached to it. That used to be the case of virtually every general store, but the, the post office isn't very happy with that arrangement much anymore. But it still is the case in Marshfield, and I think that Steve and Nancy and Tish and their design team, I think they did a great job in terms of maintaining the historical integrity of the store, right? And today, Steve's sister-in-law, Tish, is the general manager of the store. The Corrals today own a house in Cohasset. They're out here every summer, as they were this summer. And, uh, and no summer today in Marshville is complete without a confirmed Corral sighting at the general store. So we've talked so far about safe general stores, which is a key part of the picture. However, you know, when I put this talk together, I realized it was also important to pay some homage, if you will, to general stores that have never needed saving. General stores that are so ingrained, so woven into the fabric of their respective communities, they've never had to be saved. They may never need to be saved. For people who live in these towns, it's impossible to imagine how this store could not be there. They're what I call tried and true, and I always feel like it's important to, you know, to sort of take a nod to some of these. One of my favorites, I'll share one, is up in Norwich, Vermont up in ski country, you know, kind of between, I said Norwich, I meant Warren. Norwich is coming up. Warren, Vermont, which is kind of equidistant between, oh, say, Sugarbush and uh, Mack River Glen. So it's right up there in the Green Mountain. There has been a general store in Warren, Vermont. This is the 40s, but it's been there for over 200 years. And it is the heart and soul of Warren, Vermont. If you are anywhere within 20 miles of the Warren store, you probably are in there at least once or twice a week. And uh, it is the heart and soul of Warren, Vermont. It's a very special place, very warm, very inviting. Um, I was last up there a year ago, 
last March. It's getting further and further away. But it was March of 2016. And the reason why I remember specifically is because it was, whether you care to recall or not, it was presidential primary season. And I dropped in and said hi to my friend Jack Garvin, who owns the store. I said, Jack, you know, what's new? And he said, uh, what's new, what's new? He said, oh, here's something that's new. And he told me that they were having a contest to name their big wood stove. <laughs> the days get long and dreary in winter in Vermont. <laughs> and, uh, I said, well, have you had any good candidates for a name yet? And by the way, the wood stove, most general stores have some kind of wood stove. The reason why they could give a name and want it, or even think of giving a name to theirs is that the one in the Warren store is like a wood stove on steroids. It's huge. It's sort of the defining physical characteristic when you walk into the store. And uh, I said, have you had any good candidates for a name yet? And he said, <laughs> funny you should use that word. So it turns out that another longtime friend of the store had been in just literally a week before me, which surprised me because I didn't even know he was back in Vermont at that point. He was a very busy guy at that point. And uh, maybe he was back in Burlington doing laundry for all I know. But he did drop into the store. And Jack told him about the contest to name the stove. And unlike me, he was much quicker on his feet. And he said, I have a suggestion. And they liked it. <laughs> and he won. Bernie Sanders won the stove making contest. And, was, and you know, I've always thought, because you know, a scant three months later or so, three and a half months, he did lose out on the Democratic nomination, presidential nomination to Hillary Clinton. But I've always wondered if on some level, Bernie took some solace in the fact that unlike Hillary, he won the stove making contest, <laughs> God damn it, at the Warren store. Now, one of my favorite chapters in the book is what I call one of the kind. Because these are sort of like the, the, the combo platter of general stores. They are tried and true. They've never been up for sale. They probably will never be up for sale. But they have, each of them, a unique element that makes them, well, one of a kind. They needed their own chapter. I'll share quickly two of them. One, here we are in Norwich, Vermont. Uh, yeah, Dan and Wits. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been to Dan and Wits in Norwich, Vermont? So Dan and Wits were not the original owners. Dan and Wits were actually high school buddies in the 1930s in Norwich. They worked at the store. By the 1950s, they owned the store. And they did very well. They did very well. They were confident enough to put this sign in the window. <laughs> You've no doubt seen some variation uh, of the very same sign uh, somewhere else. Uh, but they did very well, and they wanted to expand. The problem was they had very little room with which to expand. They couldn't expand on this side because of the Norwich Inn. They couldn't expand on this side because of a park and street. So the only place they could expand was directly behind the store. There was a, a, about three quarters of an acre to expand right behind the store. So what happens is they do expand, and they create kind of two very different places. So if you walk into Dan and Wits, you walk into what certainly seems like a very traditional general store. In fact, when you walk in, the distance from the front door to where that guy, I assume his son, is standing at the freezer, is probably not even as far as where I'm standing to the back wall. So, you know, it looks very traditional, very cluttered, very nice. I like that. Um, if you walk, however, just to the left of where they are, there's a simple doorway. There's no sign on the doorway. In fact, I, I, as I recall, there's no door. But if you walk through that, you're in a very different place. You're in the back. Now, right, so basically what you have at Dan and Witch is a little traditional general store in front and then you walk through a door, and you're basically in a big box store, right? Uh, but there's nobody there to show you around. So you're in a labyrinth of rows. It goes further. That's not where it ends. It keeps you follow the ceiling. It just keeps going back and forth. And it's so massive and so labyrinth that you could get lost that day. And I am big enough to admit that I did. So the first time I was ever in there was a late winter afternoon. It was getting dark. It was about 4.30. I was with Dan Frazier, who is the original Dan's grandson, and he said, i got to run back out to the front. We're short-handed, but you're welcome to walk around, and I did. And when I was ready to walk back out, I couldn't find my way. And every sort of turn I took did not take me back out, but into housewares, and then into 
you know, lounge chairs. And, uh, and I, you know, so at a certain point, it's kind of embarrassing, right? Because it's kind of like, it's kind of like getting lost in a corn maze, right? It's not like you don't know where you are. You're probably not going to grow old in that maze, but you still aren't getting out of there right away, right? So I finally did get out, and I went back out to the front, and I said to Dan, I said, Dan, I just got lost in the back. And he said, oh, it happens all the time. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. So it turns out that Dan and Wits, they have the commercial equivalent of the ski patrol. There's no other way to describe it, right? So you know, if any of you ski, you know that you know at, when the lifts close in a ski area, uh, depending on the time of year, either about 4 or 4.30, when the lifts close to the public, then they send the ski patrol up to go down every single trail and slope and make sure that, God forbid, somebody you know, isn't hurt and left behind when it gets dark. So at 9 o'clock every night, at Dan and Wits, they send somebody out to flush out the back. <laughs> and I said to Dan, I said, you don't find people like lost back there, do you? He said, oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. He said, probably once, twice a week, we find like some 10-year-old kid walking around like that. I said, well, that's not good. He said, no. He said, you know what's really not good? He said, most of the time, we know for a fact that their parents left like an hour ago. <laughs> so my other favorite one of a kind is in Windsor, Maine, where Harlan Hussey, looks like Hussey, he was a German immigrant, pronounced it Hussey. Harlan Hussey, just like Dan and Witt, also did very well. So all through the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, he did very well on his little one-story garage-like general store. By the 1950s, 60s, he wanted to expand. Who could blame him, right? But like them, he had, was limited to where he could expand. He couldn't expand in the back. He couldn't expand on the side. He could expand vertically. So he did. He did. And he added, he added the two floors. So you have a basement level, lower level, you have the ground floor, and you have a second floor. So you can imagine there's a lot of stuff in this store. But what really makes Huzzies unique for, in all the world, as far as we know, is the combination of things that they sell. Let me give you some idea. When you walk in, you will find a guide sign to guide you to the many different things on three levels that you will find in Huzzies. Start reading from the bottom for maximum effect. Right? So wood stoves, home and garden, plumbing, electrical paints, hardware, camping gear, fishing, yeah, yeah, hunting supplies, guns, bridal gowns, clothes. Whoa, what? Right. Right. So Huzzies, Huzzies in Winter Maine is the only general store in the world where you can buy the combination of guns, gowns, and beer. <laughs> or basically one stop shopping for a shotgun way. So no, I I don't say that facetiously, I say that factually. Because when Harlan Huzzy's granddaughter, Kristen Ballantyne, was married, she had this picture taken in front of the sign. And sure enough, there is the lovely bride with a six pack of Schlitz, the bridal bouquet, and the groom holding a brand new 12 gauge. Now, as we finish up, as we finish up, um, I want to, well, so I have found talking about books for five years, uh, that um, book talks evolve. They evolve. If they don't evolve, you're probably not paying attention either to what people are interested in or what you've written. In either case, not good. So I began to notice, so the book came out uh, about a year ago, just a little bit less than a year ago, and I started giving book talks in October of last year. And I would notice within the first few months that I always take questions, just like I will tonight. But I began to notice that within the first two or three questions, if I got to four questions and somebody had asked me, I started to be surprised. And that was, do I have a favorite general store? So, you know, I would answer. And again, a few months go by. And I began to notice that not only is this question asked every single time I talk about the book, but that my answer is the same. So I had to start to look at why it is that my answer is always the same. And when I did, I realized I should share this because it wasn't 
my favorite general store. It isn't my favorite general store because of any particular thing that it sells. Uh, it doesn't look wildly different than any other general store. Uh, there's nothing particularly special about it other than the fact that it shouldn't be there. Not because I wouldn't want it to be there, but because you would think at a certain point people would just give up and say, Fate doesn't seem to want us to keep a general store here. And it embodies everything that is wonderful about a community refusing to lose its general store, unlike anywhere else I know. There has been a general store in Putney, Vermont, for over 200 years, 1796. And of course, we're one of just 13 different owners of the Putney General Store. It has. Um, most of that time looked very much the same. You can see that it's always looked very, very similar, right? It's always been in the exact same place, just above Little Sackett's Brook, right behind it there in the center of Putney, Vermont. Always been there, always been a general store, always been in that same footprint, except when it wasn't there. Right? Right? Sounds like a root. The first time that the Putney General Store almost wasn't there was on a terrible night in May. 2008, when about 2 o'clock in the morning, a fire broke out due to some faulty wiring in the third level, the attic. And thank goodness for volunteer fire departments, because they were able to muster very quickly. They were able to get there. They were able to save. It looks bad, but they were nonetheless able to save almost two-thirds of the store. And the first call that Lisa Papazian of the Historical Society made the morning after that fire was to our friend, Paul Green. And she wanted his counsel, his wise counsel, and he jumped in his Prius and he drove down from Burlington. And he said, well, the first thing we need to do is put the community in terms of owning the general store. Because the owners of the store were nowhere to be found, for good reason. They had no insurance. So they wrote it off as a loss and they skipped town. So as Paul told her, he said, it's very difficult for an entire town to skip town when you own the store. So he worked with them, and they raised federal money. They got state money. He helped them write grants. They attracted a huge amount of, of donations from across the state. And they were able to take ownership of the store themselves, the town, the historical society. They were able to rebuild the Putney General Store and the beating heart of Putney, Vermont. Population, 987 people, was beating once again. And all was good in the little town of Putney. For a year and a half. Because incredibly, less than two years later, another fire broke out. And as bad as that looks, uh, and it's bad, it's a, a complete loss. As bad as that looks, it's worse. Because this time there was no faulty wiring found, but investigators pouring over the steaming rubble did find traces of massive accelerant. Arson. Arson. So this time, the small, tightly knit town of Putney had to deal with the double gut punch that not only have they just lost the heart and soul of their community, but the person who did this horrible thing might be your neighbor. Who the hell knows? And people felt that fall in early winter, like there had been a death in their family. And indeed, that's exactly how it should have felt because the store was like extended family to the entire town. Again, they called Paul Brew. At this time, Paul was significantly more somber in his assessment. He drove through the night. He was there at 6 in the morning. I told him to meet him at the church across the street from where the store had stood. He was asleep in his car. When they got there, he got out, broke sleep from his eyes. They went into the church. And he said, well, here's the first of the bad news. He said, it's only been a year and a half. The federal money is contingent on the collateral that was the store. So I don't know where that puts us, to be very honest. And there was a lot of tears. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of frustration. There was a lot of sadness. After about half an hour, people were to gotten through the town, which is time that they were meeting about the store. 
And now there were 50, 75 people. Within an hour, there were over 120 people. They had to move the meeting outside into the cold open air. And after about an hour or so, an older gentleman who, whose family went back five generations in Putney stood up on that little low stone wall that's right between the church and the street and the store where the store is. And he stood up on that low stone wall and he said, I just have one thing to say to you. He said, I will be goddamn if an arson will define my town. Paul Broon kind of let his words hang in the air. He stood up and he said, well, if I read the move correctly, we need to rebuild. And the one single saving grace, the one single silver lining of this awful thing is that this was such horrible news. This made front page news all over the world. It was such horrible news all over that Putney, well, the money poured in. Donations poured into Putney. They had more than enough to rebuild the store. They were able to actually start an endowment for the store. They got donated labor from everything from timber to you name it. A local sawyer came forward to cut the timber. They were able to reopen the store. Now, mind you, the, the, the historical society owns the store now, but they still needed somebody to run the store. And they found a wonderful person who came forward. He was a local pharmacist, and he said, well, he said, uh, the store for me and my family, he was an immigrant, had been an immigrant, and he said, the store for me and my family has been like family. The store made us feel welcome when we barely spoke English, and I want to give something back. If I can run my pharmacy out of the second floor, I won't take a dime from the profits of the store. And they said, great. And all was good again until New Year's Day 2017 when this wonderful gentleman died. And neither of his children wanted anything to do with running the store, and the store closed again. But this time, Paul Broom beat them to the punch, and he called up Lisa McPace. He said, Lisa, first, I'm sorry for your loss. Second, open that store. She said, well, how are we going to do it? We don't have anybody. He said, open the store. Lisa, you have, how many people do you have in the store? Girl society? She said, 42. He said, fine. Everybody put in an hour a week. Open the store. Because he told her, I have data up and down my left and right arm that will show you. The longer a store like that remains closed, the longer it will be before you reopen. And they did. They put together a skeleton crew. They reopened the store in May of last year. The store is open again. And as Paul Broom puts it so well, Putney is truly about perseverance. And as I close, I do want to point something important now. And that is, we've been talking about all these wonderful stories of general stores being saved. They haven't all been saved. And just in the time that I wrote the book, we've lost more stores. There's been no general store loss more significant than in 2012, six years ago, when Ray's and little, the little town of Adamsville, Rhode Island closed. At that point in 2012, it was the longest continuously operating general store in America. 224 years, or roughly 25 years less than the country had been running. But it closed, and more poignantly, this is actually a page from my book. So when the book went to the publisher last fall, the Monterey General Store was still open. Now it's closed. So we're still losing stores. And we will lose more stores anyway, but we would lose more were it not for the fact of a new breed of general store owners. And I feel like they really need a nod. They deserve a lot of credit. Some of these folks, and for the most part, they're younger people, millennials, people barely 30, and people you might not expect, the generation you might not expect that would have the same feeling about community, having grown up in a very different way than their parents and grandparents. And yet some of these folks, some of these folks are behind these stores and keeping them open in a way that you wouldn't expect, like Taryn and Ben Marcus in Whitefield, Maine. Never imagined they would run a general store. Never wanted to run a general store. They're farmers. They met at agriculture school in Washington State. Ben's family was from Whitefield. When they graduated, they moved back to Whitefield. Their hope was to be able to afford a few acres of land that they could farm. But farmland in you know, central Maine is expensive. It's expensive. And they weren't able to afford anything. 
And finally, a, a local guy came up to me one day. He said, listen, I know that you folks are trying to afford some farming. He said, I'm going to make a crazy offer. He said, I will give you five acres of prime farmland that will produce like gangbusters for you. They said, what's the catch? He said, I don't have the catch. He said, the catch is, there is a long defunct general store on that property called Sheepskin General Store. He said, if you will reopen the store, the land is yours. And they still deliberated. That's how much they didn't want to run a general store. Finally, they decided, you know what? We'll only buy stuff at the store that we like, especially food. They said, we'll only buy food that we like to eat. No, because their thinking was, when this thing goes, goes south, they can at least personally liquidate all the inventory. <laughs> right? They won't have to go food shopping for a year and a half. Didn't happen. Oh, well, the land produced all right. Incredible organic produce. And they were selling it at the store. And about six or eight months go by, and they look at each other one day, and they said, you know what? Wouldn't it be great? If instead of just selling our produce at the store, and one of us traveling every week 250, 350 miles to hit every single farmer's market in South Central you know, New England, what if we could also serve the food, open up a little cafe at the store? Wouldn't that be great? And they found a wonderful person to open up a little cafe at the store. And today, Sheepskin General Store, after 37 years, is reopened. Now listen, if you're a general store purist, I'm here to tell you, you will not be able to buy an anvil at the store. <laughs> you will not be able to churn your own butter. But guess what? For about 175 years, no one has walked into the Sheepskin General Store looking for an anvil. However, people are looking for a wine tasting, artisanal cheeses, childcare, a small local lending library that which they have opened. They have open mic night now. And today, Sheepskin General is back open. It's popular with young. It's popular with old. And I think it gives hope. And what can give more hope about the future of general stores and the reopening of Hope General in 2016, that because of this new breed of general store owners, God bless them, I think the future is at least guardedly optimistic for New England's general stores. And that is their story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. True to my word, um, I'm happy to take a question or two. If this is it, you don't have to ask me what's my favorite general store. Uh, and you don't have to ask me what's my second favorite either. Uh, yes, sir? How many general stores are there in New England? That's a good question, and I have to give it to you approximately. Yes. There are approximately 231 general stores in New England, give or take. And when I say give or take, that might be about 20 or 30. Uh, approximately. At one time, however, you talk about losing the general stores in New England. So up to about 1990, about 25 general stores a year were closing in New England every year. Now there's still about 11, 12 sometimes, or were last year. Uh, but you can see that they're disappearing at a much different pace than they were uh, 30 years ago. Yes, sir? What's your distinction in the definition of a general store. Ah, I thought you were going to say, what's your distinction of a general store versus a country store? <laughs> zero. Uh, zero. That, that, uh, that, those terms are used interchangeably, even by folks who are in the book, country store, general store. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking. This is why I invite my agent, Irv, to have <laughs> um, That's his job. He asked that. Uh, it's a great question because it really goes to the heart of what, why general stores matter more than ever. Because my own personal distinction, and what do I know, but I mean I think somebody like um, uh, Ray Oldenburg would tell you the same thing. I think what makes a true general store, so you, you, you do this yourself, right? You, you've driven by places that, that may say, you know, East Oshkosh, country store, general store. That does not make you a general store. You can call yourself anything you want. I can tell you in, in, in what is it, three words? A community gathering place is what makes a general store. All general stores sell stuff. Uh, no general store today can survive without the big changeover. The, I joke from Anvil to hardware, basically. The big changeover is all general stores in the same business now have to do something good with food. They have to. Um, but it's being a community gathering place. 
That is what makes Genesis. It is a place where the community feels, it's a third place. It's a place where people feel, yes, they may be running in to get a quarter milk. Yes, they may be running in to get a pair of shoelaces. But there is that sense, there is that expectation, conscious or otherwise, that I might tarry here and I might see a friend. That's the distinction. And to just build on that for a minute, expand on that. I've often been asked, too, um, do general stores only have to be in rural areas? Absolutely not. You know what else is a general store? A bodega in the middle of Manhattan. Because you will find that these small stores, these little bodegas that might draw their customers, except you know, the person passing by, but their regular customers may be drawn from, you know, you think of the density of a Manhattan neighborhood, they may be drawn from just two or three blocks, right? But for that <coughs> two block area, that's a community gathering place. And in a place like Manhattan, it can be even more wonderful to run into a familiar face when you run in. So it doesn't matter where a general store is. It can be in the middle of a city. What makes a general store a general store or a community gathering place, you can find anywhere. Anywhere. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. How many general stores have you actually visited? Mm. Um, I have the pounds to show for it, too. Um, I visited, in writing the book, I mean, I have visited more general stores than are necessarily profiled in the book. I figure I've been in about 100 or more general stores. But for the book, I visited about 64. And of those, about 20 less than that is, are in the book. Um, I just, you know, I, I, as long as I have the time, uh, I just love to pop in. Partly it's about feeling like even if I just buy loaf of bread or, or a sandwich or a cold drink, I'm, I'm doing something uh, to, uh, to help them. But uh, um, they're hard to pass by, if you, if you like. They're hard to pass by, like a diner. Anyone else? Yes, sir? <laughs> Another great question. The Vermont Country Store. Is it in the book, you're wondering? So that, well, that's very interesting. So we're talking about the Vermont Country Store, and you, you said not, not that it's in the book. It actually is in the book, which I assume may surprise you, right? So the reason why, how many of you are familiar with the Vermont Country Store? Almost everybody, right? The Vermont Country Store is nobody's image of an old-time little general store. And it ain't. It isn't. It isn't. But there's a reason why it's in the book. And it's a fascinating story. I'm not going to bore you with the whole long story. Uh, it is in the book, however. Uh, but I will tell you the bare, the bare outline. The, the Rock Country Store, for those of you who don't know, right, it, is, it exists, well, it exists in brick and mortar form. There are actually two of them, three of them now uh, in Vermont. The main one is in Weston, W-E-S-T-O-N, Vermont. Um, but what, and, it's, and it's massive, right? And they do a huge mail order online business. Uh, and it's massive, so you would never think it's a community gathering. And it isn't a community gathering place. So it defies every metric in some ways for general stores. But there's a reason why I felt honor bound to put it in the book, and this is why. First of all, it's an amazing story of, of how it develops, because it has its roots in an authentic, as they come, general store. The forebears of the, of the owner, the present, you know, the family that owns the general store, uh, the Ortons, uh, their great-grandfather owned with his father-in-law a small general store in northern Vermont, around the turn of the 1900, right around. And they ran that for about 20 years, and then the father-in-law died, and, the, and, and, and Orton moved to Massachusetts, reopened general store, had a son, now you're up to about World War II. The son goes to Washington, gets married, and they move back to Vermont. And they have the idea that, because everywhere he goes, and he tells people he's from Vermont, he says, oh, I love Vermont. I love Vermont maple syrup. And, and they think, you know what? People love Vermont stuff. So they had this crazy idea. It was 1947. It was after the war. And they had this crazy idea. Why don't we take our Christmas card list, and we'll just send people a little order form and say, hey, we're in Vermont, you're not. We'd be happy to send you the following genuine Vermont things, including maple syrup. And they, they could not pack this up 
stuff up quick enough and send it out, right? So then, Look Magazine, now gone, but Look Magazine in the 1950s gets wind of this. And they send a photographer. And they do a spread they call the happy little storekeeper in the mountains of Vermont. It sounds lovely, right? Problem. All over America, thousands of people read this story and say, oh, I want to go drop in on the happy little storekeeper in Vermont. <laughs> Problem. There's no store. <laughs> so, so, Russ Orton had to create a store. So he and his wife bought an old building. It had once been a general store, had long been shuttered. They reopened it. It, in fact, became the first general store to ever reopen in the state of Vermont. And people started screaming to it. And things took off from there. And his sons, the Ortons, now it's what, the fourth generation, they created the Colossus in Western Vermont. And it's today, you're still probably wondering reasonably enough, so why is that in the book? This is why it's in the book. There is no family on the face of the earth who does more to save general stores, the real kind, the real small struggling general stores than the Ordens. Every year they've created a foundation and every year without a lot of hoo-ha, they funnel tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes paying the rent, the lease for small general stores for a year or more at a time until they can tie themselves over. And I felt, you know what? It may not be a community gathering place, but it is responsible for saving a lot of genuine community gathering places. That's why it's in the book. Did I mention I have the book? <laughs> Listen, I want to thank you very, very much. Those are some of the best questions I've ever, those, those are like the greatest hits of questions I'd like to answer, so thank you. Thanks, Irv. Uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Um, I will be over here, as I mentioned. I, I, if you'd like to purchase a book, I have all three of my books here tonight. And I would be delighted to personally sign one for you if you'd like to purchase. Whether you buy a book or not, I also have a sign-up sheet here for my newsletter. Uh, and I like to keep people, I haven't sent one out for a little while, but um, I like to keep people kind of updated, especially when, like now, when I have another project beginning. So uh, if you'd like to give me your email address, there is a 50-50 chance you'll never hear from me again. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do better. Thank you very much. Thank you.